Okay, so today's daf is Kuf Mem Chet. We're going to start on Kuf Mem Zayin Amud Bet. Very bottom, Kuf Mem Zayin Amud Bet, uh, very bottom of the page. Last line, Vein Machzina Tashever, where it said uh, you can't return if somebody's bone gets uh, broken, so you can't set it on Shabbat. That was what it said. So Amar Rabbi Chana Bagdeta'a. Rabbi Chana from Baghdad said, Amar Shmuel, in the name of Shmuel, Halacha Machzirin Teshever. Actually, the Halacha is you can set a bone on Shabbat. If somebody breaks a bone, you can set it. Rabbi Baba Chana Iklala Pumbedita. Once Rabbi Baba Chana came to Pumbedita, Lo Al Le Pirkeid Rav Yehuda. Rav Yehuda was the uh, was the uh, Rav of Pumbedita. He was giving a shiur. He was giving his uh, his communal his public address. And he didn't show up. So Rabbi Barachana was visiting Pumbedita. And the proper respect is if you're visiting a town, you know, you go to the, whoever the rabbi of the town is, you go to their address, you go to their drasha, and you listen. He didn't go. So what happened? Shadre le adad He sent after him uh, a, uh, somebody named Ada, who was his messenger, who was his worker, to bring Rabbi Barachana to the shiur. Uh, he didn't come. So Amar said to him, Zil Garbe, go and seize his property to force him to come. Because, you know, they had power. They had, they had power. They can, he told him, go seize his, his, uh, uh, you know, his clothing or whatever, one of his pieces of clothing to hold it as a collateral until he shows up. So Azil Garbe, he did that. Ata Ashkechei de Kadarish. And so Rabbi Barbachana had no choice because now he was, you know, in trouble with the, with the boss for not showing up to the class. So he, he had to get his, he wanted to get his uh, clothing back. So he had to come. So he showed up at the Shi'ur and he heard Rabbi Yehuda saying, De Kadarish en Machzir et Shever. He was telling everybody that you can't set a broken bone on Shabbat. Amar Lei, Rabbi Barbachana interjected in the Shi'ur. So he showed up and then he, and then he interjected. He said, Hachi Amar Rav Chana Bagdeta'a Amar Shmuel Rav Chana Bagdeta'a said that Shmuel said Halacha Machzirin et Shever that actually that's wrong you're allowed to set the bone on Shabbat it's a good thing I showed up because I, and gave me back my shirt yeah or whatever it was Amar Lehi said to him Ha Chana Didan Va Shmuel Didan Velo Shemiali you know what Chana Bagdeta'a Rabbi Chana Bagdeta'a is from our neighborhood he's from Babylonia and Shmuel is one of ours, and I never heard any of this before. Isn't it such a good thing that I confiscated your property? Because if I hadn't confiscated your property, you wouldn't have shown up. And if you hadn't shown up, I wouldn't have learned this. I would have still thought that you're not allowed to set a bone on Shabbat. So it turned out that it, we, we're, we're living happily ever after. We're all we're happy about this. Now, so what happens if somebody's arm or leg becomes dislocated on Shabbat? So this is not broken, but dislocated. So Rav Avya Rav Yosef. Rav Avya was sitting in front of Rav Yosef. And his arm became, or his hand became dislocated. Amar he said, Hachimai, can I fix it like this? Asur, no. Hachimai, what about this? Amar Asur. So he kept saying, can I move it like this? Can I move it like this to fix it? And uh, he kept telling him, no, you're not allowed to manipulate the dislocated arm on Shabbat. But he kept saying, can I do this? Can I do this? So what ends up happening is, eventually it fixed. Because he kept saying, can I try this? Can I try this? Can I try this? And it, it ended up working. Uh, yeah, he just moved it around and slips back in. So, Amar Le Maiti Bailach. So he asked, he asked him, why do you keep asking me whether you're allowed to do anything, whether you're allowed to fix your dislocated arm? Hatznan, we learned in the Mishnah, we learned in the Mishnah that if, that if a person's leg or arm becomes dislocated, they shouldn't massage it in cold water, which I guess was how they usually rest- cor- corrected the problem, but he can, take, he can wash his arm, and if it becomes, uh, you know, automatically it slips back in, it slips back in. So Amar Lei Velot Tanan didn't we learn in Machzirin at the Shep? So 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 the thing is that Rav Rav Yosef is asking uh, Rav Avia what he thought. Why did he think he would be allowed to, to to put the dislocated limb back together when it says clearly in the Mishnah that you're not allowed to? He said to him, Well, Amar Lei Velot Tanan in Machzirin at the Shever. Amar Rav Chana Bagdeta Amar Shmuel Alach Machzirin at the Shever. He said. 
the reason why I thought maybe fixing a dislocated shoulder or a dislocated leg could be okay was because it's, it also says in the Mishnah that you're not allowed to set a broken bone. And Rav Chana Bagdita'a said that Shmuel said that you can set a broken bone. And they overrode that halakha. Basically. So I thought maybe the same thing about this halakha. Maybe they also said you can correct a dislocated arm, a dislocated leg on Shabbat. So he said to him, So he said to him, Are you uh, weaving them all with one weaving? In other words, are you assuming everything is the same? He said, That wherever it's stated, it's stated. Wherever it isn't stated, it isn't stated. In other words, uh, you can't generalize from that statement. So just because it says that you're allowed to uh, uh, set a broken bone doesn't necessarily mean that you can fix a dislocated limb. Although it it turns out that the Shulchan Aruch allows both of them. He says you can set a broken uh, bone and you can also, if uh, if a limb becomes dislocated, you can also pop it back in on Shabbat. That is actually the halakha that's brought in the Shulchan Aruch. Hadran ala chavit, hadran ala chavit, hadran ala chavit. And we conclude, perek chavit. And we come to the 23rd perek, which is sho'el. Sho'el adam mechavero kadei yayin vekadei shemen. A person can borrow from his friend. Barrels of wine and barrels of oil. As long as he doesn't say, Halveni, lend me them. Because if you say, lend me them, it sounds like a business transaction on Shabbat. And similarly, a woman can borrow from her friend loaves of bread, but she can't say, Halveni, lend them to me and I'll pay you back because that sounds like a business transaction. She can just say, give me them. If he doesn't believe him, he doesn't trust him. In other words, so somebody comes over and says, can I have a uh, barrel of wine? And, and you figure he'll probably pay you after Shabbat, but you don't know for sure. Sure, you don't trust him. So what do you do? So he has to leave his talit with you. He leaves the collateral. And after Shabbat, you work out the details. Similarly, erev Pesach on Yerushalayim. In Yerushalayim, when erev Pesach was Shabbat, so what did they do? If a person needed to get a korban Pesach, but it was Shabbat, normally erev Pesach is a weekday. So you needed to get a korban pesach, no problem. But if it's Shabbat, you can't purchase the animal. You got to, you don't have an animal on you, and you need to get an animal. So what do you do? You leave your talit and you take the korban. And after Yom Tov and Cholam Moed, you pay the guy back. Now, the reason we're going to see in a second why this makes a difference, it says Sho'el Adam. You can borrow, but you can't say Halveni. We'll see why that is. So the Gemara says, Amarle Ravabar Rav Hanan. Ravabar Rav Hanan said, Labaye, Maishna Hashileni, O Maishna Halveni. Why is it that in Hebrew you're allowed to say Hashileni, lend it to me, but you're not allowed to say Halveni, which is another word for lend it to me? What's the difference between the two? Right. Why are you allowed to say Hashileni, which means let me borrow something, and Halaveni means like more like lend me something, but really it's kind of the same thing. So Amar Lai said to him, Hashileni lo atel mechtav, Halaveni atel mechtav. So Rashi explains that, that uh, Hashileni means let me borrow something quickly for a short time. So if you say to somebody, let me borrow something for a short time, you're not going to write down the, the the agreement. You're saying I'm going to give it right back to you. When you say lend me, lending sounds like a long-term commitment. A long-term commitment, there's a concern. You're going to write up a contract to solidify and remember the details. Like lending and loaning. Like but, or let me borrow that versus can you give me a loan? Can you give me a loan? Sounds like business. Can, you let me, can I borrow that? Maybe it's a quick thing. I'm going to return it to you right away. Okay? So, but wait a second. We have a logical problem here. Because in the weekday, sometimes, sometimes a person might use the language halveni, lend it to me. Um, so, I'm sorry. He says that sometimes a person might use these, this language interchangeably during the week. So you're saying halveni means a long-term borrowing situation, and hashileni means a short-term borrowing situation. Halveni means we might write down the terms of the loan, and hashileni means we probably won't write them down. But the reality is that there are times where maybe it's appropriate to say halveni, but you use the term hashileni. And people are not that careful about this, these interchangeable terms. And, because, and since it is a long-term loan, even though you use the language hashileni, you might write down the terms. So on Shabbat, we should be concerned that even if you use the term hashileni, which maybe technically means a short-term borrowing, but sometimes is used interchangeably in slang or colloquially, it's used to mean even a long-term loan. Um, and so sometimes the word hashileni refers to a loan where you actually do write down the terms. 
You're just not using your language exactly. You're not using it precisely. So, so too on Shabbat. You might say Hashileni and maybe you'll come to write it down. Why, why are you assuming that on Shabbat the person is using their language exactly precisely? But on the, week, when on the weekday, we know that they don't. So we skip those parentheses. But Shabbat, Kevan de Hashileni, who de Sharule Rabbanan Halveni lo Sharule, Min Kirab Mil Tavlot El Mikhtab. The answer is that since the rabbis came along on Shabbat and said you can only use the language Hashileni, you can't use the word Halveni, so a person is going to remember, oh, why can I only use the language Hashileni? Because I'm not allowed to write. And he won't come to write because he's not allowed to. During the weekday, we use it interchangeably. We don't care. But on Shabbat, somebody will say, oh, remember, only say Hashileni. Why? Because that's the only thing you're allowed to do. Oh, then you're going to remember. You're also not allowed to write down the terms because you're limited in your use of language in that case. The Shulchan Aruch, by the way, says that in most other languages, there's no distinction between Hashileni and Halveni like this. Let, loan me and loan me or lend me and lend me. Uh, it's pretty much the same thing in most languages. And he says, therefore, the only thing you can say is Tenli. Give it to me. Right, give me a, give me a thing of wine and work it out later. But the the let me borrow sounds like the same. We use the same word borrow when you borrow money from the bank uh, as when you borrow uh, a cup of flour from somebody in their house. It's it's the same same language. The Shulchan Aruch says. So Amar Rav Barchan Rav Abaye Rav Bar Rav Chana said to Abaye Michdi. Let's see. Amru Rabbanan Kol Mila Diom Tov Kama Dev Shalosh Shanu This is this is basically unrelated to what we said so far. Just because Rav Bar Chana. But Rav Chana is, is asking uh, Abaye something. Now this time it says, uh, 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 right, Bar Rav Chanan rather is asking Abaye something. He said, and everything in Yom Tov that we do, we try to we try to change from the normal weekday way of doing it as much as possible. So Hanen Ashe these women, Dimalyan Chatzavayhu Maya, that they fill up. Uh, they fill up uh, buckets with water on Yom Tov and bring them. So, why don't they do it in an unusual way so that it doesn't look like weekday labor when they go to the well and they fill their buckets with water? The reason is because there's nothing they can do to make it look different than the normal way. Why not? What are they going to do? Uh, so, so, what are they going to. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. If they use Limlu uh, Bachatzva Zuta, that if they would normally use a large bucket, they should use a small bucket, right? So, but the problem is that there, Hakam Avshuba Hilucha, you're making them walk more. In other words, they're going to have to make more trips. So how are they going to change the way that they get water from the well so that it'll show that it's not a weekday? Well, if they normally use a huge bucket, and today they use a small bucket. But if they do that, then they're going to have to make ten trips instead of one trip. They're not going to want to do that. Okay, so... but Maybe you'll say, well... Instead of using a small bucket, use a big bucket. So do something to make it different. The answer is, come up Shuba Masoy. So there you're carrying a heavier thing. So every, it's a, it, no matter what you do, you're creating more problems. Okay, we turn to Amud Bet, Nifros Sudra. Why don't we cover over the bucket with a cloth? So people will say, oh, that's, they're carrying it only, it's a special carrying on Yom Tov only because they covered it with a cloth. Really? But Ateli De Sachita, the problem is that it's going to become, when you walk with your bucket of water, the cloth is going to become saturated with water and then you're going to squeeze it out. That's another problem. So we can't do that. Okay. Maybe we can put a cover over it. And it would, tie, there was, it would be a cover that was tied to the barrel. We could put a cover over it for Yom Tov. But the problem is that maybe it will become broken. The cover will break off and then you'll tie it on. And you'll make a permanent knot on Yom Tov. So anything that you do runs the risk of some other problem. And that's why there's nothing you can really do. Therefore, there's nothing we can really do to change from the normal way of collecting water on Yom Tov that will show that it's special. So that's why you're allowed to do it in the normal way. Uh, Rav Bar Rav Hanan asked Abaye another question. We learned in the Mishnah. You're not allowed to clap your hands. You're not supposed to beat your chest. And you're not supposed to dance on Yom Tov. Okay? Now Rashi says that be- beating on your chest here means out of sadness, or clapping your hands means out of sadness. Uh, Tosafot points out that those things are already mentioned even as things that you're not supposed to do on Cholam Moed because, uh, because they're signs of mourning. So certainly not on Yom Tov. So Tosafot says it means clapping your hands and clapping your thigh out of joy. You know, when you're singing, clapping. So, the, so he says, but wait a second. Don't we see that everybody dances and claps their hands on Yom Tov? We don't say anything to them. 
Isn't that true? Uletamech, but according to you, Abaye said, back to Rava Barav Hanan. That which Rava said, Lo Tevini Shapuma de Lechia, Dilma Migandarle Chefetz Vatel Ituyeh. Didn't Rava say you're not supposed to sit at the end of the Lechi? Remember, we learned about this that if you have a, an alleyway, and the alleyway is considered a private domain because it has walls, and it goes right into the public domain, so they would put a Lechi. A Lechi is a vertical piece of wood, or they would put a Korah. Which is, a, which is a horizontal piece of wood over the top, to remind you not to carry from inside the mavoi, from inside the alleyway, into the public domain. Okay? So he said, don't sit right on the edge. If you sit right on the edge, you're gonna, something you're holding is going to roll into the public domain and you're going to grab it. Rava said you're not allowed to. And yet we see what? We see, But we see that people bring their buckets and all kinds of things, and they put them right on the edge of the Mavoy, and uh, nobody says anything to them. Nobody says, hey, you know, didn't you hear that Ravah said you're not supposed to do that? And yet people do it, right? They put their, their stuff right there. So he says, El Israel. Rather, that what's the general principle here? Why is it that people clap their hands and dance on Yom Tov and they put things right at the edge of the Mavoi on Shabbat? The reason is because Mutav Shishogigin Va'al Yom Mizidin. Better that they be mistaken and not do it on purpose. In other words, if you tell somebody, hey, don't do that, and they do it anyway, now they're doing it on purpose. At least if you keep your mouth closed, they're doing it by accident. Maybe they don't know any better. But if you intervene and you tell them not to do it, and then they say, I'm going to do it anyway. Who do you think you are to tell me that? Who made you the king? You know, th- now they're doing it on purpose. Now they're going against them. B- b- so the Gemara says, Savur They originally thought, what, what did they mean by this? They meant only in rabbinic laws. Because clapping your hands on Yom Tov or Shabbat is only an Isur de Rabbanan, rabbinic rule. Sitting on the edge of the Mavoy is only a rabbinic rule. Because maybe something will roll into the public domain. But maybe a, a biblical thing, but they'll write the law. Maybe biblically prohibited things. We do intervene. The answer is Velohi, no. Loshina Bidurabanan, Veloshina Bidurita. Doesn't matter if it's rabbinic or biblical. That we see a proof that even when a biblical law is at stake, we don't nec- we don't intervene. If there's reason to believe that we will not be listened to, that's the point. Because what do we see? We see that on Erev Yom Kippur, the rule is that you're supposed to have Tosefet Yom Kippurim. What is Tosefet Yom Kippurim? You're not supposed to, let's say sunset is uh, uh, 6.51. I don't know, I'm just making it up. On, Yom, on Erev Yom Kippur. You can't eat until 6.51. You have to make tosefet. You have to, you know, let's say 10 minutes extra, 5, 10 minutes extra. You're supposed to add on to it, right? Because it says, Me'erev ad erev tishbitu shabbatchem. From evening to evening means you have to start a little bit before evening and make it uh, a, a little extra. So, but yet the women didn't know this halacha. It says, uh, 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 even some of the men probably didn't know this halacha. And so they would eat all the way up to the last second, not realizing that you're supposed to make Tosefet Yom, yom Kippurim, even though that's considered Min HaTorah, that's considered required Min HaTorah Midioraita, biblically required to add a little bit onto Yom Kippur from beforehand. And the women didn't know that. And I, I mean, it says in other sources the women. Here it doesn't mention women. Um, but that's, that's, I believe, what the context is. The point is they didn't intervene and tell them because they figured it's such an entrenched custom for people to do that, they're not going to listen. So it was so entrenched that people would clap on Shabbat. It was so entrenched that people would sit on the edge of the Mavoy that there was nothing they could do to weed it out. So better to say nothing or, or to approach an individual who you think might be receptive than to try to ban it. Because if you try to ban it, people are so attached to doing it, they're not going to listen and they're going to end up doing it on purpose rather than by accident. So we said, a woman can borrow loaves of bread from her friend without saying, lend it to me, and we'll work it out after Shabbat. You're saying that you're allowed to do this, on, that you're not allowed to... Uh, in other words, the point is that on Shabbat, you can borrow the, the uh, loaves, but then uh, on the weekday, you, you have to return the loaves, Right? So that implies that this transaction is a kosher transaction. I'm allowed to come to you, say, can you lend me two chalot? I don't have chalot. Oh, sure, here, take chalot. And then the next week, I'll bring you back two chalot, right? That's fair, right? That's what it sounds like you're allowed to do, right? But the problem is, wait a second, that's not true. 
Our Mishnah is not following Hillel. Why? It's not because it says in the Mishnah, Hillel, Haya Hillel Omer, Lo Talve Isha Kikar La Haverta, Ad Shitasena Damim, Shema Yukruchitin, Venimsu, Baotli De Ribit. The problem is this. Let's say the price of a chala today is five bucks. Okay? I gave you two, you gave me two chalot, so what did I really borrow from you? No, I borrowed you 10, 10 bucks, right? Now, I cut, now the wheat prices go up, and the next week the price of a chala is six dollars. <throat> okay, I returned you two chalot the next week. I just gave you twelve dollars for the ten. Because the two chalot I gave you, they're worth two dollars more. So it's rebit. It's, uh, it, it's considered to be, it's considered to be a, uh, a type of uh, interest. So what do we do? That's why he says, You have to make it an, a quantity of money. So when I borrow from you, when I borrow the chalot, I say, okay, I'm borrowing $10 worth of chalot. So if the next week the prices have changed, let's say the price went down. I could also rip you off. Let's say the price went down. Now, I, 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 I borrowed a $10 of chalot, and I come the next week, and it's only $8. Okay, so I made $2 then. Right, so, what the, so the halakha is... Right. That's the thing. That, so how can it be considered rebid when... It it's the, a, it's the, rebid made the rabban because, I mean, it's a whole lot. When we get to Masechet Bavam Metziah in a couple of years or whenever we get that, we'll learn about the difference between rebid kitsutza, that, you know, if, if you, you, that really, you know, biblically, uh, mina Torah rebid is only when you make a specific arrangement of rebid, not like this. But they made a lot of gezerot because people do a lot of funny business when it comes to money and they wanted to, they wanted to prevent... Right, they, wanted to, they didn't want people to play games with it, with it. you know, uh, if you want to charge interest, oh, uh, play a game, you know, with the, this kind of commodity uh, bartering. Right. So they said bartering can be a dangerous thing because you end up doing rebeat inadvertently. So the, the point is, you shouldn't be able to just return to Chalot the following week because Hillel said you should always formulate whatever transactions in monetary terms. So that way, if the, if the market for some commodity fluctuates, you're not affected by it, basically. That's what it's saying. And you can so, you can't... Uh, well, well, that's the problem. In other words, that, that's the problem. So, te, hilel, even Hillel might agree here. Basically, the point is that in a place where the prices are fixed, in other words, a chala is always a dollar. Okay, there's price controls imposed. So in a place where there are price controls, no matter what the price of wheat is, it's always a dollar to buy a challah because there's some kind of regu- there's government regulation, let's say, on the price of uh, on the price of chalot for whatever reason. So in a case where the prices are stabilized and there is no fluctuation based on wheat prices, so then you would be allowed to do it. In a place where the prices are not stabilized or controlled, then you would have a problem of uh, rebit. So, what if you don't trust the guy? So, what happens? What do you, you do, he has to leave a collateral, right? He comes and he wants to borrow something. He has to leave a collateral. So, what do you do? So, it's where it was stated. Here's the, here's the deal. Rav Yosef says, you know this whole thing about lending people stuff on Yom Tov? It's a dangerous business because technically it's not enforceable in court. Why? Because a guy walks in. He says, I need a cup of flour. I need, uh, I need challah. I need meat. You give it to him. The assumption is he's going to work it out with you after Shabbat. You come after Shabbat or after Yom Tov, whatever. You say, okay, where's my... Th- what? I th- you gave me a gift. What do you mean? I owe you what? I, I didn't... Show me, uh, show me proof. We couldn't write. It was Yom Tov. It was Shabbat. Okay, mm-hmm. well, you know, an oral agreement is not worth the paper it's written on, you know? That's what they say. So the, uh, you know, there's nothing we can do. That's it. So, so Rav Yosef says, you can't, you can't sue somebody. Rab, Rabba says, nitna litba, that you can sue somebody in court to recover what you lent them on Shabbat and Yom Tov. So Rav Yosef, Amar lo nitna litba. So Rav, Rav Yosef says, you can't sue somebody di'i amrat nitna litba atel mechtav. Because the problem is, if they enforce it in court, you're going to come to write it down. Because you're going to, in other words, when I, when I go to my friend's house and I say, please give me a challah, I don't have a challah for Shabbat. Now, if he knows, he's going to lend me the challah, right? So I'm going to hopefully give him the money back. But if he knows that he can enforce that in court, he's going to say, well, wait a second. I want to I wanna write it down. Because if I don't, you know, I'm not going to be able to recover my money. So the fact is he has to know from the beginning that I might not return it and still be willing to give it to me. Because otherwise, there's a concern he's going to want to write. If he's only giving it to me because he thinks he's going to be able to take me to court, then he's going to want to write it down. 
And Rabba Amar Rabba says, Nitna litzba, you can in fact, in, this is enforceable in court. The problem is that if we don't make it enforceable in court, then nobody's going to lend it. Because it says, You're going to detract from people's joy and Yom Tov. Because I'm going to come to David's house. I'm going to say, David, can I please have uh, some uh, challah? He's going to say, well, no way. I don't trust you. And I, there's no way for me to write it down. I, I'm not going to shake on it. I'm not going to believe you. Forget it. So then I'm going to, I, I, so it has, it has to be enforceable in court. So he knows that if I default and I don't bring it back, that he can sue me. Okay. Now. Tanan, we learned in the Mishnah, it's low, that it says if you don't believe the guy, have him leave a collateral with you. Have him leave his taliti. I'm not bishlam alonit nalitba. So if it's not enforceable in court, mishumachim aneach talito, it's low, then it makes sense. Ve'oseimo chajmon nachar shabbat. It makes sense that the, the strategy is that if I come to David and I want to uh, b- borrow a chalan, he doesn't trust me, he says, leave your talit here so I know you're going to have to come back. And if you don't give me my money back, I'm going to keep your talit. Okay? He doesn't say that on Shabbat, but it's understood. That makes sense if it's not enforceable in court, right? Because that means that since he knows it's not enforceable in court, he needs some, something to hold over my head. That's, uh, that's what we call Ose Adam Din Lenafsho. A person can make a din for himself, mm. okay? Uh, he can do a, a dina lenafsho. He, he's, he's allowed to, uh, or dina lenafsho. Yeah, he can, he can be a vigilante. In other words, if somebody took something from you and you have something of theirs, you don't have to give it back. Until it's resolved in court, you know that's how things work. So he's allowed to he's allowed to, to do that way. So Ella i amrat nitna litba. So if you're going to tell me that uh, uh, that y- you could take the person to court anyway, so why is it then that you re- that why does the Mishnah advise you to keep a collateral from the borrower? Since you're, if, if Rabbah is correct that you can enforce this loan in court, you can take the guy to court after Yom Tov and insist that he give you your halab money back. Okay, so then why does the Mishnah tell you to keep a collateral? If we have a principle that Avid Inish Dinal Nafshei that a person is allowed to uh, uh, to hold on to the, to the collateral, that makes sense. But if he can enforce it in court anyway, why, why does he need to hold on to the collateral? So Amar. The answer is because he says, listen, I don't want to get involved in litigation with this guy. That's so funny. That's exactly right? Funny. He says, I don't want to go to court. Who wants to go to court? It's a long line. To this and that. You know what? Just leave me your shirt here so I know that if you want it, you gotta, if you want your shirt back, you have to bring me my money back. That's all. Because I don't want to end up in the court system. Who wants to get in the court system? I guess that was always true. That's something timeless. Rav Idi Baravin. Rav Idi Baravin raised an objection. If a person slaughters a cow and, and divides up the meat on Rosh Hashanah, so what's the deal here? It's the la- so Rosh Hashanah is two days. Either the month of Elul is 30 days or 29 days. Right? If the month of Elul is actually 29 days, then that means that the first day of Rosh Hashanah is really the first day of Tishrei. If really, the, the, if really Elul is 30 days, which it could sometimes be, then the 30th day of Elul is the first day of Rosh Hashanah, but really it's part of the last year. Right? Like on Rosh Chodesh. On Rosh Chodesh, when we have one day of Rosh Chodesh, that means that the previous month was 29 days, so we need only one day of Rosh Chodesh. If the previous month is 30 days, we have two days of Rosh Chodesh. Day one is really the 30th day of the previous month. And day two of Rosh Chodesh is the real Rosh Chodesh that we count the month from. Okay, that's how Rosh Chodesh works. It's different than any other Chag. So Rosh Hashanah, let's say Elul, let's say this year was Shana, was a uh, Shanata Shemitah. This year is a sabbatical year. So Shanata Shemitah means that at the very last day of the Shemitah, all loans are canceled. Okay, that's at the very last day. So let's say it's the first day of Rosh Hashanah. If, this, if really Elul is a 30-day month, so that means that the last day of Rosh Hashanah is still part of the previous year. It's actually the last day of Shemitah. The first day of Rosh Hashanah, the first day of Rosh Hashanah will be the last day of Shemitah. If Elul was only 29 days, then the first day of Rosh Hashanah is really the first day of the new year. Now, 
if the so if he slaughters this cow and he divides up the meat on the and it's really the thirtieth day of Elul. It's not really the new year yet, but it's the first day of Rosh Hashanah. But really, it's part of the previous year, like Rosh Chodesh on the first day of Rosh Chodesh. It's really part of the previous month. If you write a ketubah and somebody gets married on the first day of two day Rosh Chodesh, you write. It's the 30th day of the previous month, which is Rosh Chodesh. You don't write that it's the first day of the new month. Because really the first day of a two-day Rosh Chodesh is part of the previous month. Now, what happens? So if that day is really part of the previous year, that means it's Shemitah. And so you went to somebody and they slaughtered a cow for you and gave out the meat. And what were they expecting you to do after Yom Tov? Come pay them. Right? Because uh, they couldn't pay you for the cow. Right? So you went over to the Shochet and you were really smart and you said, Hey, yeah. uh, Mr. Shochet, you know, could you just make me a nice cow and slaughter me a cow? And, you know, we'll talk after ho- the holiday, but we'll work it out after the holiday. Okay, That's sure. Sure. So he goes, he slaughters you the cow. Now it's the first day of Rosh Hashanah. If that first day of Rosh Hashanah really turns out to be part of the previous year, so it's going to cancel that loan. Right. So he's going to come to you after Rosh Hashanah. So uh, you said we'd work things out. Yeah, we did. We worked them out really well because since that first day of Rosh Hashanah was part of the Shemitah, I don't know you a penny. It's a no. Isn't that nice? Very nice. Now, what's the point? Now, what, why are they bringing this? If you can't sue somebody for a loan transacted on Yom Tov, you can't take them to court. So, my Mishamet. So, what is the point of even saying that Mishamet, that the loan is cancelled? What difference does it make that the loan is cancelled? You can't collect it anyway in court. So, either he's going to pay you or he's not going to pay you. So, what, what difference does it make if it's officially cancelled? Officially cancelled, big deal. You can't take him to court anyway. So, you must conclude that what? You could have taken him to court. But when you come to court, the Betin is going to say, Sorry, cancelled. Okay, now, uh, okay. So ve'im. Uh, so now the Gemara says, "Shane hatam." You can't prove anything from there. De iglai milta de cholhu, because what happens here? Something very, very interesting. If you transacted that loan of the cow on the on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, and it turned out to be part of the previous year, right? And by being part of the previous year, that means it was part of Shemitah. And because it was part of Shemitah, the loan that you got of that cow ends up being annulled, right? But what also ends up happening in retrospect? Was that first day of Rosh Hashanah really Rosh Hashanah? No. It was really the last day of the previous year. It really wasn't Rosh Hashanah. Because if it turns out that, in other words, the way that it would work was, and the reason why we have two-day Rosh Chodesh is, because they didn't know. They would all, when, when the 29th day of Elul came, that night they would start keeping the 30th day of Elul as the first day of Rosh Hashanah. But they didn't really know that it was the first day of Rosh Rosh Hashanah. If the moon appeared that day, they would say, okay, it was the first day of Rosh Hashanah. If it didn't appear, then the second day would become Rosh Hashanah. So in this case, if you find out actually that that first day wasn't really Rosh Hashanah, it was part of the previous year, that means it was weekday anyway. So the loan that you actually transacted, did it really take place on Yom Tov? No. You went to the Shochet, said, slaughter me up an animal, give it to me, and I'll take care of you after Yom Tov. He slaughtered it for you. He gave it to you. It turned out that that day was actually part of the previous year. Yes, the loan was canceled, but it would have been enforceable in court. It would have been enforceable in court because... It wasn't really Yom Tov. Let's say in a similar case, let's say the person had come and they came to you on the first day of Rosh Hashanah to the Shochet and they were given the, the animal and it wasn't a Shemitah year, it was just a regular year. But it turned out that it was a two-day Rosh Hashanah. The second day was the real day. In other words, it's enforceable in court before or after. In other words, after. It, it, okay, so it's even after. after. So, after. so the point is that normally it would have been enforceable in court because actually that loan didn't take place on Yom Tov. That that loan actually took place on a weekday. It's just that they were they were observing it as Yom Tov because they weren't sure if it was going to turn out to be Yom Tov or not. Enforceable as a written contract. As a contract, as a loan, or as a verbal contract. Verbal contract. I mean, the verbal contract. Is enforceable with witnesses. With witnesses, yeah. With witnesses, it's enforceable. Um, Why not have it on Yom Tov? 
they didn't want you to write that. They were afraid that if they made it enforceable, this is the machloket. In other words, Rav Yosef is saying that if they made it enforceable, then what's going to happen is a person's not going to rely on the witnesses. They're going to want to document. So what is okay. this new case bringing? What is what the new case was bringing yeah. in was they thought, oh well, you see that the loan is canceled. Yeah. But if, if a loan that takes place on Yom Tov doesn't even count in a court of law, so what does it mean the loan is canceled? Okay. It shouldn't have even been enforceable to begin with. Oh. Shemitah or not. The fact that so the fact that it's canceled by Shemitah means or... that it must have been enforced. It would have been enforced if it wasn't Shemitah. So the Gemara says, yeah, that's true. It would have been enforced if it wasn't Shemitah. You know why? Because in retrospect, that 30th day of Elul, which was part of the previous year, so it wasn't really Rosh Hashanah at all. It turns out that it wasn't really Rosh Hashanah. That's why it was counted towards the Shemitah year in the case. Because it was never really Rosh Hashanah at all. Just like Rosh Chodesh, when we have a two-day Rosh Chodesh, the first day of Rosh Chodesh that we're keeping is not really Rosh Chodesh. We're observing it as Rosh Chodesh, but really, if we were to look in retrospect, it wasn't really Rosh Chodesh. We count the month from the second day of Rosh Chodesh. Same thing here. Now, so uh, although the way that we observe Rosh Hashanah today, we observe the first day is the real day. It's not like it used to be. Oh, so that we don't do that. In those days, they observed it out of doubt. So they right. observed it. I thought we still do it. We don't do it out of doubt now. We do, we, the first day is the real day for us on Rosh Hashanah. But yet the two days are equal in... Uh, yeah, they're equal in Kedusha, yeah. So, okay. So now the Gemara says, but wait a second. Tashma, but look at the end of it. Misefa. Ilav eno mishamet. It said that if that, 30, if that first day of Rosh Hashanah turns out to be the real Rosh Hashanah, then the loan is not canceled because that loan took place on... The, the new year. It wasn't Shemitah. Right? It wasn't Shemitah. It says it isn't canceled, but wait a second. Not canceled means. So that, but we have a, so now we can learn the other way. In other words, if you're telling me that if that day of Rosh Hashanah where you borrowed the meat, you got the meat from the butcher for free and you're going to pay him back later, if that was Rosh Hashanah for real, that means it wasn't the Shemitah year anymore. So, what that means is, it says, Eno mishamet. it isn't canceled, but that means it's enforceable. No. Not canceled means it's enforceable, because why would it say, Eno mishamet? Huh? I, I thought it on, you know. That's what they're arguing about. They're trying to prove one way or another. You have a machloka between Rav Yosef and Rabbah. They're trying to prove, is it enforceable or not? So he says, well, from the fact that it says that if it took place on Rosh Hashanah, and that was the real Rosh Hashanah, that it's not canceled. Why is it not canceled? Because it's the new year. It's not the Shemitah year anymore. When you borrowed the, the beef, it wasn't Shemitah. So, oh, well, if you're telling me it wasn't canceled, what does it mean it wasn't canceled? It means I can, go collect, I, I can collect it in a court of law. Isn't that what it means? So it must mean that it's enforceable. So what does the Gemara say? No, maybe not. Maybe not. What it means is that if he comes and pays you, you can take it. You can't sue him. You can't sue him. Are you telling me that if it was actually Shemitah, let's say that he borrowed the meat during Shemitah, and he comes later and he wants to pay you anyway, even though technically the loan was canceled, he feels bad, he wants to pay you anyway, you're not going to take the money? In other words, if we're not talking about enforcing in the court of law, we're just talking about people are doing a good faith repayment. So you're telling me you can't take the money? Well, true, he could take it. He has to tell him that I don't want the, that you don't, you know, that I cancel the loan. I know it. In other words, this whole issue isn't about whether it's enforceable in a court of law or not. This whole issue is about does he have to tell the borrower, if the borrower comes with, to pay him for the beef that he took on Yom Tov, does he have to say to him, I cancel the loan. It's, you, you don't have to pay me. If he forces him to take the money, he can take the money in either case. But he, the question is whether he's required to release him from his obligation. If he wants to pay it anyway, he pays it anyway. But he has to release him if it took place on the Shemitah. And if it didn't play, take place on the Shemitah, he doesn't have to release him. But in both cases, it's possible that it's not enforceable in a court of law. We can't prove that it's enforceable in a court of law because we're talking about two good faith individuals dealing with each other. Now, the Gemara says, Kid we learned in the Mishnah. If somebody wants to return a loan that was canceled by Shemitah, Yomar lo, he says to him, I cancel it. But if he says, even though you cancel my loan, I insist I want to pay anyway. I want to pay you anyway. I'm a nice guy. You can receive it. Because it says in the Pasuk, This is the matter or the word of the Shemitah. The word devar means... 
word, meaning he has to say to him that I mishamet, I, mishamet, I, I cancel it. If the borrower feels guilty and he wants to pay you anyway, we don't have to turn away money. It's rebeat, you're not allowed to take. If somebody wants to pay you interest, you're not allowed to take it. Even if they say, I don't care, I, I, I'm mochel, I, forgive me, I, I, I want to give you, I want to pay you interest. So you're not allowed to take interest. Writing, would that be enforceable? What? After the Shemitah, if he did that, says, I want to pay you anyway, and he did that in the He can't write it in the, he can't write it in the contract. You can't write it in the contract. You can't, you can't, write, it. can't write it in the contract. Uh, in other words, but the only way that this can happen is out of good faith. Good faith. In other words, That's technically, the Dalacha is that unless you had a Prus bowl or something, it, if Shemitah passes and you didn't collect the loan, you can't collect it. But if the guy says, listen, I feel guilty, I borrowed the $10,000, I, I don't feel like I, and I didn't, you know, and you didn't make a Prus bowl, but I don't feel like I can walk away with $10,000, I need to make, he has to say, I cancel it, I cancel it. But if the guy's really nice, he doesn't have to take, turn him away. It's different than Rebit. Rebit, if a guy comes, to you and he borrowed 100 and he says, I want to give you 120, I feel, thank you so much. And you have to say no. He says, no, really, I want you to have it. I, I'm really thankful you really helped me out with my business. No, I can't take it. Give, give $20 to Tzedakah but don't give me, I, I can't take it. Okay, you cannot take it. So that's the difference between Shemitah and uh, Ribit. So Rav Avya, Shakil Mashkona, what Rav Avya would do was if he lent somebody something in Yom Tov, he would take a collateral from them. Rabba Bar Ula Marim Iarume and Rabba Bar Ula would play tricks on the people. In other words, he would go over to their house and take something from them and hold on to it until he got his stuff back. Okay, that's again, Avid Inish, Dinala Nafshe, he would be a vigilante and uh, take a, even after the fact, take something to hold it over the guy's head so that he wouldn't uh, have to worry uh, about getting repayment. Now, incidentally, what is the Shulchan Aruch uh, uh, rule on this? The Shulchan Aruch, the Rambam, the Shulchan Aruch rule in accordance with uh, Rabbah here, that it is enforceable in a court of law. That the rabbis said it is enforceable because they wanted to encourage people to... <coughs> to uh, give on Yom Tov so that Simchat Yom Tov would be upheld. So therefore, if you go to somebody's house and you borrow a flower or you borrow challah or whatever it is on, on Yom Tov or Shabbat, that that let that loan can be enforced in a court of law. You know, the person can come back and sue you after Yom Tov for the money. Uh, and they, they can't say, what do you mean you gave me a gift? If it was understood in the context that you were going to pay it back. It's a verbal contract. You have to have yeah, you can have witnesses. I mean, otherwise it's going to be like it's going to be my word against yours. Yeah, you might have oaths, right. oaths and other things. So let's just do a little bit more. And then we'll conclude. So, Amar Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Yochanan said, that a person can consecrate their Korban Pesach even though it's Shabbat. So Shabbat falls on Erev Pesach. You can consecrate your, your sheep and Chagiga Tov Yom Tov. And if it's Yom Tov and you need to bring your Korban Chagiga, you can consecrate the animal on Yom Tov. It seems to be supported by the following. It certainly seems that way from our Mishnah, because our Mishnah says that you can go and purchase, basically, you can acquire your sheep on Shabbat itself. You can go over to the guy, leave him your talit to show that he has a collateral, take the sheep, because it's Shabbat, there's no way you can handle money. You take the sheep, you consecrate the sheep, you bring the korban on Shabbat, because when Erev, Erev Pesach is the day they would bring the Korban Pesach. You would bring the Korban on that day, and then after Yom Tov, you would pay him back. So what do you see? You see that he's able to purchase, if he's able to purchase the, uh, the sheep to begin with, on Yom Tov, obvious, or on Shabbat, obviously he's consecrating it on Shabbat. So you're allowed to. So, maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe we could say that really it was Mikadash Vikae. It was already sanctified before Shabbat. What is that? What are we talking about in the Mishnah? We're not talking about a guy who purchases a sheep on Shabbat by leaving a collateral. We're talking about a guy who comes to you and says, Sammy, you have a Korban Pesach and you're allowed to share. I want you to include me on your Korban Pesach because you had to be, um, it's Tachosu al They had to agree in advance. They had to be counted on, this, on the sheep in advance. So you can't invite somebody on, in, on the night of, you know, at Arvit, on Pesach, you can't invite them to your seder. They had to have been signed up for the Korban Pesach in advance before you slaughtered it. So they come to you on, it's a Shabbat, they forgot to get a Korban Pesach. They come to you, they say, you have one. I want you to count me on yours. He says, well, you know, you have to pay for it. You know, I'm not going to, there's no free lunch. I mean, if you're going to... Masechet Pesachim has some insane... A lot of stuff, yeah. Of, the, ...of this kind of rendition. Yeah, so, so you want to you wanna be on my Korban Pesach, you got to pay me money to be on my Korban Pesach, right? You're not going to give it to him for free, right? 
It's expensive. So what happens? So you say, okay, I'll leave you my talit. Count me on your Korban Pesach. I'll leave you my talit. And after Yom Tov, since it's already Shabbat, I can't pay you today. And we're going right into Yom Tov, so I can't pay you then. I'll pay you after. Here's the talit. Count me on your Pesach. But to sanctify the Korban Pesach, you wouldn't be allowed to do. Okay, that's the implication here. Um, okay, and what about the following Mishnah? You can't be counted on the animal on Yom Tov. So that would seem to imply that uh, it's not possible to, uh, to, to include somebody on a korban on Shabbat or Yom Tov. Shani hacha. That's different. Kevan de ragil etzlo keman de imnebe meikara. Why is he allowed to add the guy onto his korban? Because he comes every year. So even that guy who comes every year, uh, even that guy who wasn't counted to begin with, since he comes regularly, it's like it was already done from beforehand. But really, you can't do any of this manipulation. You can't really add people onto your korban on Shabbat. You can't really sanctify the korban on Shabbat. But if it's a person who always comes every year, and so you were kind of expecting him, and the korban was already set aside, it was kind of like you were expecting him to begin with. But doesn't Rabbi Hoshaya say, that you can go to a shepherd that you normally work with and he'll give you a sheep for your Korban Pesach and you can consecrate the sheep and use it even though it's Shabbat. So that shows you you can consecrate the, the, the Korban. Same thing. Since the Ro'e is someone shiragil etzlo, you go to the same shepherd every year to get your sheep, he sanctified it for you in advance. So you're not really sanctifying it on Shabbat. Doesn't it say that you sanctify it? The Yotzebo, the answer is, that's only rabbinic. Really, the shepherd sanctified it for you before Shabbat so that it would be ready for you. And when you take it and say, I'm consecrating this for my Korban Pesach, that's just an ad- additional rabbinic thing, but it, it's not the real consecration. The real consecration has to happen before Shabbat and before Yom Tov. Is it true that Rabbi Yochanan said that you can sanctify an animal on Shabbat and Yom Tov? Because we've shown that we can't prove that idea from any of these sources. Did he really say that? Generally, Rabbi Yochanan says that the halacha follows an anonymous Mishnah. And it says in an anonymous Mishnah, that you can't Consecrate, and you can't make an erech, which means you can't take upon yourself the vow that you're going to give the value of a certain person. Or it, these are different ways of, of taking vows of value on, on Shabbat. And you can't separate on Yom Tov. On Shabbat, you can't do it. So one of the things is you can't makdishin. You can't consecrate a korban. So all of these sources that we've shown that sound like you're consecrating a korban, we've already said they could be in cases where you're doing it beforehand. So Rabbi Yochanan explicitly says you can consecrate the korban on Shabbat. So, what's the, so, so how does he deal with the source that explicitly says you cannot? So, no problem. It depends. Here, where, we're, where it says you can't consecrate and you can't separate Shuruman, all these things, this is talking about where it's a kor, the korban doesn't have to be offered right now. It's not kavolo zman. It's not something that has to be done right now on Shabbat or right now on Yom Tov. So you have so you have a choice. You could do it another time, but in this case, the korban Pesach it has to be done today. If you don't consecrate it, there's no other chance. The Chagiga has to be done on Yom Tov. If you don't do it, you're going to miss the opportunity to do it at the ideal time. So therefore, you're allowed to even consecrate the animal on Shabbat or on Yom Tov because, there's no, because since the, 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 the offering of the animal overrides Shabbat or Yom Tov, so the consecration of it is going to override Shabbat and Yom Tov as well. So that's what Rabbi Yochanan said. But um, obviously... In all other cases of consecration, consecrations are things that should be done before Shabbat and before Yom Tov. And we'll stop here for today and continue. Better at the Shem